This video is brought to you by NordVPN. Check the link in the description below for details about a special deal for the Religion for Breakfast audience. What you're looking at is an ancient Christian reliquary, a box that held the bones of a saint. But this is no ordinary bone box. If you look here at the top, you can see a hole. And here in the front, another hole with a little reservoir. This was a purpose-built reliquary for Christian pilgrims to pour oil into the top, which enables the oil to flow over the bones of the saint, and then into the reservoir where you could then collect it in little flasks. In fact, pilgrimage flasks for saintly oil are among the most common artifacts we find from the early Christian period. Christians believed that this oil, having come into contact with the saint's bones, was thus imbued with the saint's miraculous power. You could do whatever you want with this oil, hang on to it as a protective amulet, or maybe even try to heal a sick loved one by anointing them with it. This artifact is one small practice within a much larger cultural phenomenon called the Cult of the Saints, or the Veneration of the Saints. There are a lot of saints recognized in some branches of Christianity. The Catholic Church recognizes more than 10,000 saints. It's much more difficult to quantify the number of saints recognized by the Orthodox branches of Christianity, since most don't follow an official canonization process like the Catholic Church does, but safe to say they recognize a lot of saints too. But according to Orthodox Christians, the saints are saints by God's grace, and only he knows all of their names. Regardless, the veneration of saints remains a central practice for hundreds of millions of Christians worldwide. But where did these beliefs and practices come from? To answer this, we need to investigate the archaeological and historical data from the late Roman Mediterranean world. First, we need to clarify some terminology. In the ancient world, a cult, or cultus to use the Latin, had very different connotations than it does in our modern day and age. While today people might use cult to refer to an abusive or authoritarian religious group, Back then, it had a very broad definition, referring to any act of religious veneration, worship, or care. You can still see this original meaning in words like cultivate. Meanwhile, sanctus, the Latin root for the English word saint, referred specifically to an individual who had lived an extraordinary life. In the earliest centuries of Christianity, a saint was almost exclusively a martyr which derives from the Greek word meaning witness. Originally, this term was used in legal cases, but when early Christians adopted it, the word took on a much more narrow meaning, specifically referring to an individual who had been killed for their faith. As the historian David Eastman puts it, a martyr, by imitating the suffering and death of Christ, bore witness to their faith and therefore was worthy of special recognition and honor from other Christians. So in the context of early Christianity, the cult of the saints refers to the general veneration of extraordinary individuals who had suffered and likely died for adhering to Christianity. People that the historian Peter Brown calls the very special dead. So where did this come from? Let's first look at the earliest examples in Christianity before looking at possible origins. One of the earliest sources attesting to the Christian cult of the saints is the story of the martyrdom of Saint Polycarp, a bishop of the city Smyrna in what is now western Turkey. The story dates to around the middle of the second century, and it describes how a local Roman ruler executes Polycarp for refusing to recant. After he's killed, the Christians in the city show a curious level of veneration for his body. The text says that the Christians wanted to have fellowship with his holy flesh. And when they collected his bones, the bones are described as more valuable than precious stones and finer than gold. Once he's buried, the Christians are said to continue celebrating the anniversary of his martyrdom. So, already in the second century, we see a few key developments in Christianity that we now call the Cult of the Saints, the veneration of remains of the very special dead, the focus on the martyr's tomb as some sort of shrine, a liturgical celebration of the martyr on the anniversary of his death, and the production of literature called hagiography, texts that describe the martyrdom itself, oftentimes in a very sensationalized or legendary manner. The story of Polycarp is interesting because the earliest Christian texts in the New Testament, which predate this story by 50 to 100 years, do not seem to pay any special attention to the very special dead. When Herod executes John the Baptist, the Gospels don't say anything about venerating his body. His followers simply bury him. Now, that's not to say the concept of relics or saints is completely absent from the Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, for example, there's a curious passage in 2 Kings in which a dead man is resurrected after his body touches the bones of the prophet Elisha. And the book of Acts in the New Testament briefly mentions how handkerchiefs that touch the apostle Paul could heal sick people. 
This demonstrates an early belief in contact relics, or secondary relics, objects that were thought to be imbued with miraculous power simply by touching a special individual. So there are some potential antecedents in Jewish and Christian scripture, but the level of veneration that we see in the martyrdom of Polycarp appears to be a new development in the history of Christianity that occurred sometime in its first 200 years. This development to venerate saintly remains did not appear suddenly nor miraculously out of thin air. In part, it grew out of traditions that were already there in ancient Mediterranean culture, specifically Greco-Roman hero cults. Unlike the gods, heroes like Achilles, Hercules, and the twins Castor and Pollux lived mortal lives, and many met a violent or premature death. Death was not the end for these great heroes, though. The Greeks in particular believed that the dead hero could still impact the living, granting success as well as misfortune. Thus, the living often sought to either gain their favor or pacify their anger through prayer, dedications, and acts of veneration. Shrines and altars were built in their honor, and the places believed to hold their remains were considered to be sacred. As an example, let's turn to a story recorded by the philosopher and historian Plutarch. Plutarch tells us that after the Persian War, the Oracle of Delphi commanded the Athenians to retrieve the bones of Theseus, the legendary Athenian hero and minotaur slayer. After the delegation returned to Athens with the hero's remains, Plutarch tells us that the Athenians, greatly delighted, went out to meet and receive the relics with splendid processions and sacrifices, as if it were Theseus himself returning alive to the city. Theseus's remains were placed in a purpose-built structure in the heart of Athens called the Theseon. Over time, this sanctuary became a place of refuge for runaway slaves, largely because Theseus was believed to be a champion and protector of enslaved people. Other examples include Iphigenia, the legendary daughter of Agamemnon, who was honored with a cultic shrine at Megara, or Emperor Hadrian's lover, Antonus. After Antonus tragically drowned in the Nile River in 130 CE, Hadrian deified him and founded a city named after him which became the cultic center of his veneration. The historian David Eastman argues that Greco-Roman hero cults demonstrate how the building blocks for the later cult of the saints were already present in the broader Greco-Roman culture. These building blocks include honoring past historical and sometimes mythological figures who had died violent premature deaths, constructing cultic monuments for them or focusing attention on their tomb, recognizing heroes as occupying a space somewhere between the divine and humans, and the practice of tying a city's identity to a particular hero because of their shrine. However, there are some significant ways in which the Christian cult of the saints differs from pagan hero cults, particularly how the relationship between the dead and the divine is conceptualized. Once the saint is dead, Christians viewed them as serving as an intercessor between the living and God, a role that pagan heroes didn't really play in earlier periods. So yes, the cult of the saints owes a lot to the veneration of Greco-Roman heroes, but as with any complicated historical process, a single explanation is too reductive. The historian Peter Brown, who literally wrote the book on the cult of the saints, says that explaining the cult of the martyrs as a mere continuation of the cult of the heroes is like reconstructing the origins of Christian church buildings based on the Greco-Roman architectural features that these buildings borrowed. Similar features, but very different buildings and functions. And that's why earlier in this video I used the analogy building blocks. In other words, Christians use the available building blocks in their culture to construct new religious beliefs and practices. Historians always like to look for examples of both change and continuity, and there are definite continuities that we can trace from earlier hero cults. But what I find more interesting is examining how early Christians adapted these practices, amplified them, and changed them in specific ways to suit Christian communities. So let's focus on this concept of intercession as the main difference from the cult of the heroes. Intercession was not an abstract concept. It seems to have emerged from new social patterns in the late Roman village, namely the rise and function of the holy man in late antiquity. Christian communities often revolved around a local holy man who functioned as an intercessor, sometimes as a local healer or exorcist, handing out amulets to villagers, or sometimes even functioning as a chieftain who resolved village disputes or interceded on the village's behalf with Roman authorities. It follows then that Christians would have started believing that these seemingly miraculous holy men, 
could continue to help them after they died, and you could directly appeal to them by praying near their remains at saint shrines, just like how you might have appealed to them while they were still alive. As Peter Brown has argued, these shrines became places where heaven and earth are joined, because the saint was believed to be simultaneously residing in heaven as well as on earth in that shrine. So let's talk about their bones, or relics. The English word relic comes from the Latin word meaning fragment or leftover. And most relics are typically one part of a whole, a fragment of a bone or a scrap of cloth. Relics come in two main categories, primary and secondary. Primary relics are taken directly from the body of the saint. They can be whole bones, fragments of teeth, or even blood. As I said earlier, secondary relics are objects that the saint's body came into contact with, either while the saint was still alive or after their death. These can be fragments of clothing or things that were involved in their deaths, like the Holy Grail or fragments of the True Cross. The overwhelming majority of relics were made out of organic material, so they can decay and decompose. So, reliquaries were designed to protect them. Written sources refer to the practice of storing relics within reliquaries as early as the mid-4th century. Many early reliquaries were made from stone and took the form of miniature sarcophagi like the example in Berlin. But reliquaries could also be made out of more precious materials. In 1860, a silver casket dating to the early 5th century was discovered underneath the floor of the cathedral in Pola. The six-sided container is decorated with reliefs depicting Christ and the apostles. Precious materials, gold, silver, and precious stones, quickly became the preferred material for creating reliquaries. So it's clear that elite Christians spared no expense when it came to housing the bones of the saints. This points to one of the major differences from earlier periods, the way that Christians radically reevaluated dead bodies as something positive rather than something negative. To your average Roman sensibility, the veneration of relics was disgusting. The pagan historian Eunapius of Sardis mocked these practices, saying that Christians were defiling themselves at their graves. Romans viewed corpses as a source of pollution. Thus, cemeteries were generally situated outside of city walls, and those working in the funeral trade were also relegated outside the city walls. So the positive reevaluation of dead bodies marked a sea change in much of ancient Greco-Roman culture. No longer were dead bodies defiling, but they represented the power of the saint present here on earth. This veneration of saintly relics really took off in the 4th century and shaped the way that Christians did Christianity in late antiquity. Today a Christian might go to mass or go to church, which usually means attending a service of some sort, sitting inside a church building. But the vast majority of Christians did not go to church in this sense. Based on what we know about the size of ancient populations and the size of the available buildings in these cities, the estimated Christian population of any given Roman city could not have possibly fit inside the available buildings for worship and liturgy. Even if we're counting house churches and big basilicas at the same time, Christians must have been meeting somewhere else, and that somewhere else appears to have been the places of the dead cemeteries, catacombs, and tombs. Early Christians built shrines at these places focused on the veneration of martyrs. The earliest known examples date to the second century, but the archeological evidence for them is either very fragmentary or complicated. One of the better preserved martyria can be found near Rome alongside the ancient Via Appia, the Catacomb of St. Sebastian, which is associated with the apostles Peter and Paul. It's a sprawling complex of underground burial chambers with a large room lined with benches. While this room was surrounded by burials, it appears to have been serving as as a dining room and meeting hall, where early Christians gathered and hosted banquets honoring the dead apostles. We know that hundreds of pilgrims traveled to this site based on the graffiti covering the walls of this room. More than 600 inscriptions have been recorded, graffiti appealing to the saints for blessings. Paul and Peter, remember Timocrates and bless Kina and Esor. Peter and Paul, may you keep us in mind and may you save us. Paul and Peter, pray for victor. Direct archaeological evidence that Christians gathered in this catacomb to write short prayers to the saints to intercede on their behalf. 
This is what the ancient historian Ramsay McMullen calls the second church. If the first church is the people attending official liturgies in fancy basilicas under the watchful eyes of bishops, the second church is a type of shrine Christianity. Christians gathering at tombs or in catacombs to venerate God's intercessors. This basically grew into a booming tourist industry. Huge pilgrimage sites cropped up, like the pilgrimage complex of St. Manos near Alexandria, where archaeologists have found pilgrimage flasks that were sold as souvenirs. Another popular pilgrimage souvenir were clay tokens. This is a late antique pilgrim token depicting a stylite. Stylites were Christian monks or holy men who lived in seclusion on top of pillars, sometimes for years at a time. The spectacle of these holy men living alone on top of pillars attracted huge crowds of pilgrims. And unsurprisingly, shrines to these holy men sprang up nearby selling amulets associated with the monk. Clay tokens such as this one were typically made with earth scraped from near the base of the pillars, and were believed to be imbued with the blessings of the living saint. As the cult of the saints grew, the cemeteries of many late Roman towns throughout the empire got busier and bigger. In Syria, an enormous basilica was constructed around the pillar of the most famous stylite, Simeon, and the pilgrimage complex of St. Manos, which I mentioned earlier, became so large that you could mistake it for a town. By the end of the 6th century, the graves of saints had become thriving centers of Christian life in their own respective regions. Even to this day, the holiest city in modern Catholicism, Vatican City, has at its heart the traditional burial site of St. Peter. Today, the veneration of saints remains a key part of practice for Catholic and Orthodox Christians alike. Even in modern secular celebrations, many communities around the world continue to host pilgrims from far and wide. In 2019, nearly 350,000 Christians traveled to the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, where it's believed that the remains of St. James reside. The Feast of St. Anthony in Boston draws a crowd of thousands to the city's north end neighborhood every year. And although the veneration of saints has been highly contested throughout the religion's history, specifically during the Protestant Reformation, the veneration of saints and their relics are among the earliest practices within Christianity, and in fact, was one of the primary expressions of Christianity in its earliest centuries. This is a sponsored video, and it's sponsored by NordVPN. A VPN stands for a virtual private network. Think of it kind of like an encrypted tunnel, and flowing through that tunnel is your internet traffic. In other words, it's a tool that ensures your secure and private access to the internet. I've been using NordVPN for a long time now because it gives me peace of mind when I use public Wi-Fi and when I use Wi-Fi abroad and while I'm traveling, which is a lot. So for example, the video you were just watching, I filmed it in my studio in Egypt, but now I'm here back in the States on vacation. And I use the internet basically that entire time in transit from point A to point B. NordVPN enabled me to securely access my work files, it encrypted my internet connection, and keeps my browsing history private. There's even a Chrome extension that lets you secure your browsing in seconds. So again, head on over to nordvpn.com rfb or use the code rfb to sign up for a two-year plan with a discount. Thanks everyone.